Welcome, welcome, welcome. Session three of NFTZ, in which we discuss pretty much everything on the internet except NFTs. Uh, that's really been my goal for most of these sessions, and hopefully we're going to continue along that trend today as we look at various different aspects of open seas infrastructure, dive into the perma web, speak about it adaptive incentive games, wildfire and weaver, uh, have an Oprah moment. Uh, I've got, I'm, I'm feeling so organized today. So something's definitely going to go wrong, but at least for the first five minutes, we can pretend that everything is not chaotic um, and begin because there is a lot to cover today. And uh, we are going to need to, um, really use all of the time that we can to get through everything that I'm hoping to do today, which uh, has let me just close that. Okay, so if you remember where we were last week, we had uh, done last, <laughs> last week's guild session was called the test of character, <laughs> um, because it really was a test of character. And uh, there were various different ups and downs as we tried to install all of these TypeScript dev dependencies that allow us strongly typed guaranteed interactions with our smart contracts, but which come with a bunch of their own trade-offs. In particular, they revealed some of the deep-seated funding problems with open source code and the lack of extrinsic motivation that exists in these non-rivalrous, non-excludable spaces, which characterize public goods on the web as it exists at the moment. We discussed the real poetry of cooperation as it unfurled in our terminal and told us about all of these high severity uh, bugs in the various different NPM packages that we installed in order to get yes. to our strongly typed interactions with our contracts. And we set about writing some tasks and some tests for our initial smart contract, which we've called Babel uh, or Babel, if you're into that kind of vowel pronunciation. And um, that was kind of where we got to. We'd written a task to uh, deploy our contracts. We'd made sure that we could deploy it locally. We'd written some tests. We talked a little bit about Chai and uh, Waffle, which is a framework that extends some of Chai's capabilities specifically for testing smart contracts. Um, and the intention for today is to take all of that work and begin to think about what it's actually going to look like in production. Uh, so it's not just about kind of writing the simple smart contracts that we had uh, in last week's guild session, but you know, how do we actually think about the market for these things? Where are the contracts going to live when we put them on mainnet? What kind of interfaces or UIs are they going to interact with? Where should we think about selling our NFTs? What kind of considerations do we need to build into our code in order to make that happen in a smooth and efficient way? Uh, it's one thing to be able to write a smart contract and implement a standard and follow along with you know, what we looked at in our first guild session by just reading the EIPs page. It's quite another to build a production application that grabs people's attention, that is uh, capable of shifting the culture in some way, which is ultimately what these sorts of things are about. You know, I love the way that Nern Babalola talks about this stuff. It's that when you speak about how nerds have created magic internet money, or even worse, nerds have implemented a fully generalizable Turing complete language in their magic internet money, and that you can kind of do anything with it. It's too, it's too much to fit into most people's heads. They're like, I stop talking all of this gobbledygook at me and just tell me why it's valuable and who guarantees it, you know, <laughs> get sidetracked into these inevitably financialized discussions. Whereas what happens with NFTs is that people are like, yeah, I, I know images on the internet. I, I can look at them and see them and enjoy them, appreciate their cultural value. I know what memes are. I've interacted with these things. And now we're just sort of lay, layering that over with some kind of uh, 
verifiable uh, infrastructure that allows us to both uh, benefit from and share these kinds of uh, cultural artifacts, because that's what they are. Um, there's a really wonderful article posted, I think, by Greg in the memes channel, some in probably week one of Kernel, which speaks about these memes as containers, which are themselves dynamic. Uh, they're they're really, really interesting article, which we'll uh, maybe get to a little bit later. But that's really the intent of these things is some kind of cultural shift, uh, which is wonderful because we've had the capacity and the technology to eliminate poverty and to make sure that everybody rises at least above the lowest tiers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs for the last 40 years. Uh, what is lacking is the political will, and in particular, not the political will only, but the political imaginary, right? The ability that we have to creatively envision new ways of organizing ourselves and relating with one another. And, uh, you know, take it from me coming in from a country like South Africa, where it's intimately part of our history and our culture and the story of this place that the greatest tool in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. This was a quote from my favorite political activist of all time, a man called Bantu Steve Biko, who was a great hero of the South African struggle, who was killed by the National Party, was killed by the states during, during the 1970s. Uh, and he understood this even back then, that really what oppression, where oppression operates predominantly is in the mind. It strips us of our creativity. It strips us of our ability to think uh, in different and orthogonal ways to the current paradigm. Uh, this is also the great promise of anarchism, which is not no rules, but no rulers, right? So that's why I've said, I've not used the word owner in talking about these NFTs because I dislike that word and I don't think that it fits in with this particular story that I'm telling today. And that is, uh, you know, the great anarchist protests have to do with running up to the police line and tickling them with flowers or rolling over uh, the, the, the barricades in sort of a Michelin man style blow up costume and in, you know, running up to the police and tickling them and doing these funny kinds of things, you're not speaking their language of violence and structural oppression, right? You uh, confront them in a creative way, which breaks the system because it refuses to interact with it on its own ground in its own rules with the language that it understands. Uh, dressing in black and smashing windows, this is something that the police know how to deal with. Being tickled by a bunch of uh, transgendered men dressed as fairies is perhaps not. <laughs> so anyway, this is, this is the cultural background to what we're going to be looking at today. And in order to do so, the approach that I'm going to take, if you sort of read a little bit further down into uh, how we're going to adapt our smart contracts today is that we're going to look at a tradable ERC721 contract, and we're going to use a whole bunch of other extensions um, and this notion of a proxy registry, which if you just read a little bit further down into the contract, you'll see that this has to do with um, what's here? open seas. Uh, proxy accounts, right? So we're going to work with OpenSea um, because it's the one that I have experience with at the moment. And so it's the one that I feel comfortable teaching, but it is not the only marketplace out there. It's certainly not the most creative marketplace out there. In particular, Zora has some really, really wonderful stuff, which I hope to be able to talk about at the end of today. If not, uh, you will see in the Guild NFTs channel um, some really wonderful examples of using full HTML pages as NFTs in Zora. And if you go to Jam Music, there's the most amazing uh, album uh, currently in currently being auctioned off Zora at the moment as we speak. Uh, and it's really wonderful. But OpenSea is the biggest marketplace. It's the one where you will get the widest audience, the most number of eyes. It certainly has uh, trading volume at some stages in excess of Uniswap, right? Which is really quite amazing. It's, it's I think over $15 billion currently this year. Uh, so it's, it's big scale stuff. And 
Um, they have a lot of infrastructure and tools that they've built over the years, which makes it easier to kind of interact with them. So that's what we're going to do. Um, but take it with a pinch of salt because there are many other ways to do this kind of stuff. And uh, for instance, um, Zora and the other one that I thought I would just quickly show you is my own work. Um, this, while I won't speak much about it, um, is a book and each chapter of the book, as you can see here, uh, it should change, there we go. Uh, and what's actually going on behind uh, this book is that um, if you look in the console here, all of the HTML is stored in our weave and then the token URI is set in my NFT contracts, which is something we'll discuss today. And the owner of these NFTs um, that dictates each one of the chapters uh, have the ability to update the token URI to some other uh, some other pointer, which would then change what appears in each chapter. So they, they are the guardians of what appears in this book, which I think is kind of fun uh, and is an interesting way of considering like alternatives to what you want to do. Like my particular intention with that book is not to, I've not sold those NFTs. I've not created a market for them. I have no economic interest in it at all apart from the uh, desire to try and make these inherently economic transactions that occur on chain into artistic statements simultaneous right it's like it's not changing one for the other it's that economic action becomes artistic expression together uh, inherently because that's the possibility of these kinds of media um, and happily yeah, I host that site of GitHub pages, uh, so I have no costs associated with that, but for other people there are server costs and all other kinds of things that need to be covered and you have to try and recoup those and make a market, uh, there's nothing wrong with that and, and OpenSea is the biggest uh, market that there exists at the moment. Now, um, before I discuss what's going on behind OpenSea, which is also a lot to take in, uh, let's just make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, and in your code editor, whatever you're using for NFTZ, this is kind of where you should be with our current Babel contracts and uh, everything that we did last week. Um, so if you just, let me just make sure that I'm using the right version of Node. Uh, you can begin by just uh, cleaning stuff. So if you run NPX hard hat clean, uh, because we're going to kind of start a little bit fresh today and it might help with uh, some random issues that we that we run into. Um, excuse me, don't do that. Okay. That's what I wanted to do, excuse me. <laughs> Let's check out the right lesson branch first. You can always see, uh, as I sort of mentioned last week, that each, uh, each lesson begins on its, its new branch and the branch uh, starts where we ended off last week. So if we just check out uh, lesson two, uh, there we go. And now we can run NPDX harder clean just to make sure that we don't run into any strange issues in the course of this guild session. Uh, that should, uh, <laughs> okay, don't, uh, if you struggle with that, there's what we need to do is, uh, as I have just struggled, um, this, this TS node transpile only one, which is just telling our um, TypeScript modules not to transpile, which is what's causing this error. So if you go ts underscore node underscore transpile underscore only equals one, and then npx hard hats, so, uh, we should be good. There we go. And that removes our type chain uh, folder and some other things that uh, artifacts and type chain are the two folders that that kind of does away with, which is fine because we're going to rewrite some of these smart contracts and recompile them. Uh, so that's kind of what we expect. Um, just, okay. 
Okay. Uh, my apologies for that. That should have uh, it worked when I was testing this earlier, but that's what you get for live, live demos. So as I say, today's session, we're mostly going to speak about like open seas architecture and some perma web stuff. Um, and we've spoken a fair bit about uh, solidity in these kinds of contracts. So if you just copy this, we'll go through it fairly quickly. What I want you to do is uh, we're going to follow the same kind of pattern that we've been following in all of these guild sessions, which is try to separate out uh, the different pieces of logic that we need in order to think about them coherently and in a structured fashion. So we're going to put into our ERC721 tradable contract all of the logic that has to do with making this stuff easily tradable for users. Uh, and we're going to keep in our Babel smart contracts only the information that is relevant to uh, the, the Babel NFTs specifically, right? There's in fact, in our uh, way of setting things up for this guild session, we're gonna have nothing in there other than references to the name, the symbol and the uh, URI where, the in, where further metadata about the contract itself is stored. Um, and we'll keep all of the tradable logic in this new contract that I would like you to create called ERC721 tradable.sol. Uh, in your contracts directory, um, you can create a new file there called ERC721 tradable.sol. Uh, and you can paste all of the all of the code that you need there. We'll go over this um, once everybody has done that. As I say, like we we're familiar at least with this uh, with these two from the Open Zeppelin contracts library that we've looked at in both previous sessions. The URI storage is the extension that allows the 721 standard to uh, store these universal resource indicators. The innumerable contract is what makes um, your NFTs uh, innumerable. It means that they have an actually sensible index, right? Because there's nothing in the ERC721 standard itself that says like, if you have a token with index 20, that 19 and 21 necessarily exist. It's not the case. It could just be anything. So implementing the innumerable stuff, makes sure that it goes from zero to one, to two, to three, to four, to five, as you mint more and more NFTs. Um, Burnable, just make sure that you can destroy uh, tokens um, in much the same way that innumerable, make sure you can count them properly. Uh, it's just a very simple extension of the 721 standard. We're aware of what Ownable does because I rage about it every time we do these guild sessions. Uh, Counters are, is this utility contract provided by OpenZeppelin, which just makes sure that we can enumerate things, we can count them up one to the next in a safe manner, uh, because <laughs> that's not always the case in Solidity. If you were with us for the guild session uh, in Ethernauts, you will have seen me cause a token overflow in one of their challenges. Um, and then these two are new. Uh, and when you checked out lesson two, you would have got this new common uh, meta transactions directory and this has to do with really two things uh, are going on here uh, we get native meta transactions uh, which is what allows us to ensure that when people are using OpenSea to either list or trade our 721 tokens they don't have to approve and then trade them in this classic kind of double pattern which spends more gas and is really clunky and high friction from a user perspective. It just allows them to simply submit an order, sell it, trade it, send it uh, with, with one transaction only. Uh, and that's what's going on with our proxy registration, which is what I'll talk about in a moment. And the context mixed in is just making sure uh, that because we're going to be using OpenSea's infrastructure and whitelisting their proxy address to handle these meta transactions for us. Uh, this contract just makes sure that um, anything which relies on message.sender or 
any particular piece of context associated with a given transaction is passed along correctly. Uh, that's the, the sort of important aspect of those trans those uh, contracts, which I've sort of given you uh, without wanting to spend too much time on them. You can look into them yourselves, you know, and, and like, again, I could spend another hour speaking about these and the kind of trade-offs that we're making, um, but I think that everybody that is left here realizes that all of engineering is about trade-offs. And if we want access to wider marketplaces, then using these kinds of tools and techniques, which are recommended by OpenSea themselves and come almost directly out of their own developer documentation is one of the things that we need to do. And the only thing that we need to think very carefully about is what the hell is going on with this proxy registry? What, what kind of permissions are we given it, giving it? You know, I've sort of said at a very high level that this thing is being used for meta transactions so that I don't have to like approve, uh, you know, OpenSea to spend, to transfer my NFT and then transfer the NFT. I can just do all of that in one transaction, but how can I be sure? Uh, how can I be sure that it, this is what, the proxy registry is doing how can i be sure I mean, that yeah there's sorry just just the question that might be related is from juliet in the chat is this contract trading the nft on chain or off chain this contract is tra trading the nft on chain uh yes um and the way in which it's doing it, so you know generally speaking you, uh, because of the way that the 721 standards works, which generally requires approvals, right? If, I, um, if I'm a seller and I create 100 NFTs that I want to sell through OpenSea and uh, none of this native meta transactions and context mix-in and anything that I've just kind of like referenced now, you don't implement any of that kind of stuff then you need to approve OpenSea to uh, sell your NFTs, each and every single one, right? Um, and this kind of stuff prevents that really bad UX and friction. It, it, it just means that I can submit one transaction rather than hundreds. Uh, and that users who want to buy it also like just one transaction or who want to transfer it just one transaction. Uh, it's if you read their documentation and it's something that we're going to go and look at now, right? Is that like, it's really about, um, if you can see here, OpenSea whitelisting, right? Uh, in their, uh, in their docs under the ERC 721 tutorial in like one of the first sections, they talk about this stuff. Uh, and it says like, if you uh, sort of whitelist the proxy accounts of OpenSea, then your users are automatically able to trade any item on OpenSea. Um, and this, each user on OpenSea has a proxy account that they control. And this is ultimately called by the marketplace contracts to trade their items. So like, huh, okay. You know, like <laughs> they're behind OpenSea sits a whole contractual infrastructure which has to do with these marketplace contracts, which are not uh, open source as far as I know, although we can go and try and look for their source on chain. Uh, and then the marketplace is actually where all of these bids and offers and sale is happening. Uh, and each user, you know, when you initialize, I don't know if, if, if any of you have done this yet, but if you uh, initialize your accounts on OpenSea, what you're doing is creating your own proxy address, right? your own proxy accounts, which allows for these native meta transactions to happen and a really smooth UI where it's just one transaction when you submit a bid, one transaction when you transfer stuff, one transaction when you sell stuff, one transaction to set up a whole collection, in fact. Um, and it's really, it's really worth understanding like what this proxy stuff does, right? Because like I can go and read the documentation and be like, okay, there are these marketplace contracts. There's an entire ex contractual exchange infrastructure happening behind OpenSea. But how do I really know that uh, the proxy contracts are doing what they say they're doing, right? And how do I know that by 
putting them into my own contracts in this way, which uh, sort of looks quite scary in the code, right? It is approved for all, and we're whitelisting this OpenSea con proxy contract. And yes, we say it's for easy trading, but how, how do we know? <laughs> how do we know that that's what's going on? Um, and we can go and expect it on chain, right? Uh, the, the proxy address, we will, uh, it's available in their documentation. This is not a secret. And uh, it's also in our code. I'll get to it a little bit later when we're looking at tasks and tests. Um, but this is the, if you go to the contract tab of the OpenSea proxy registration uh, and scroll down to look at its source code, you'll be able to kind of take a look uh, and they, they have some kind of usual stuff up in front, but it's from about line 100 that things get interesting. This is where the proxy registry is declared. Uh, and we see that this has mostly got to do with different kinds of contracts being uh, sort of authenticated, submitted by users, initialized. There's some delay period whenever a new contract is submitted. Um, and if we look, there's, there's kind of like a little bit of strange stuff if we really read uh, this, these comments, you know, so that like this delay period mitigates a particular class of potential attack on the Wyvern DAO. What the hell is the Wyvern DAO? And what the hell is, uh, is YWV? You know, why on earth do we have reference to Wyvern DAO and all sorts of strange stuff going on in this proxy? That's kind of a little bit, you know, concerning. Uh, and if we, we stroll a little bit further down, these are just all uh, functions for sort of registering new proxy contracts and doing um, upgrades, accepting proposals from other users. Then we see, okay, there's this Wyvern proxy registry. So the Wyvern again, like, hmm, you know, what on earth does all of this stuff mean? Uh, there's some initial exchange protocol stuff going on here. So that's kind of interesting, this Wyvern proxy, it seems to have something to do with an exchange protocol that I, I've never heard of Wyvern. So if I scroll a little bit further down, um, I can see that there's an authenticated proxy uh, and this seems to be like a little bit more promising. Uh, here is a very interesting function, uh, particularly if you were with me for the Solidity Guild call last Friday, where we discussed in depth this low-level solidity call called delegate call with whatever call data is passed to it. So this, this is really interesting. Like what this proxy function is doing is uh, it's receiving an address uh, where another contract is, a whole bunch of stuff about how to call it and a whole bunch of bytes, uh, which are the data with which to call uh, whatever contract is being targeted. And it uses a delegate call, which allows us to pass context along in any transaction and is the thing that allows us to freely mutate the storage of one contract from within the context of another. Uh, we, we discussed that a fair bit in the Solidity Guild. And if you want me to go into more detail, I can, but uh, it's just a low level Solidity call that allows for this magical thing of changing the storage in one contract from the context of another. So like, that's where the proxy is happening. We're like, okay, cool. That's great. Uh, there's, you know, a whole, there's the actual proxy contract itself and this fallback function with a whole bunch of really scary assembly. So loading into memory, the first 32 bytes and this call data size stuff and delegate call in assembly. And so, oh, a lot, <laughs> it's a lot going on here. And I'm not gonna pretend to be, uh, someone who is very, very comfortable with assembly, but this is kind of interesting, right? It's like, I don't really, from first read of this proxy stuff that we're allowing access in our contract, I'm not really convinced that it does only what OpenSea says it does. Uh, and I can, I can kind of read the rest of this contract, but I have, and it, it didn't give me much insight into what's really going on. So. The next thing to try and do is actually research Wyvern. You know, what, what, is, what is Wyvern? Uh, and what does it have to do with OpenSea? Uh, and if you go and look into it, you'll see that Wyvern is a first order decentralized exchange protocol. Isn't that amazing? You know, what on earth did those words mean? <laughs> 
it's really, uh, you know, it's, this is kind of what I was talking about last week when I say that it's one thing to be able to deploy an NFT contract in 20 minutes or 15 minutes as some of these medium posts will do. It's a whole other ball game to think about what's actually going on when you have that kind of stuff in, in your code, which many of these tutorials That's do. That's it. Um, and this sort of goes into some history about Ethereum itself. In particular, I'm a very big fan of 0x. They were one of the first exchange protocols and some really incredible people uh, who perhaps were a little bit early you know, before Uniswap and some of the other later successes that we've seen. But it's really interesting, this Wyvern, uh, decentralized exchange protocol has been around for some time and uh, it differs from the first generation decentralized Long. exchanes, Long. which Long. are like Long. Ethernet, Zero X and Dexy, all of which are zeroth order. Long. What happens in a zeroth order exchange, Hatek, maybe? Long. Andy, if you want to give me co host I can mute people later too. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so a zeroth order exchange like zero uh, X or some of these others, what you will see uh, in, in these kinds of things is that each order specifies a desired trade of two discrete assets, right? So Uniswap is also a zeroth order exchange in some way. Um, and Wyvern is different to that, right? It's, uh, it says it's a first order decentralized exchange protocol. And what that means is it specifies predicates over state transitions, right? Which is a complicated way of saying that an order is a function mapping a call made by the maker, a call made by the counterparty and the order metadata uh, to a Boolean, either, you know, this trade is successful or it's not successful. So instead of taking, uh, you know, the sort of, two discrete assets and seeing if there is a trade that it can make happen, which is what you see in most of these zeroth order exchange protocols. Wyvern is uh, working instead over state transitions, which is, it's really fascinating to be honest, like the stuff around Wyvern is, is extremely well thought out, very, very interesting. And if you're into this kind of stuff, it will give you great insights into the, like, you know, we talk about these infinite design spaces in, mechanism design and crypto economics and all of these kinds of things. And, and it really is that, right? Because if you go and think about all of the content that is just published on the Paradigm blog and around Uniswap and 0x and some of these other decentralized exchanges, that's all just zeroth order stuff, right? There's this whole other world which has to do not with like the trading of necessarily discrete assets, but state transitions and thinking about um, the way in which we can use those to create trades between like any arbitrary thing, right? Uh, and, and that's the great power of Wyvern, these predicates, right? The, uh, the things that uh, come before any state transition predicates, uh, they're arbitrary, right? Which is clearly why OpenSea is using them because they can be used to trade not just fungible items like we see going on in most of the decentralized exchange protocols, but non-fungible ones too. Any, any state changing function can be mapped in these kind of first order exchange protocols. And uh, Wyvern is probably the best example. It's very well audited and uh, you, know, you can go in and, and, and read for yourself in greater detail what's actually going on here, but it's really wonderful. And I'm, I'm quite a big fan. Um, and understanding like a little bit about Wyvern makes me uh, a little bit more comfortable with what's going on in these proxy registry contracts, because this is all from Wyvern and it's all been audited and is used by more people than just OpenSea. This is not OpenSea's own code. Uh, it's, it's, it's used by, by an industry standard, uh, which not many people know about. But uh, as I said, this is the actual exchange protocol, which powers more uh, the more value traded uh, on OpenSea than Uniswap in the previous months. Uh, and and it's, it's actually powered by Wyvern. Uh, and this is again, just like insight into the actual kind of, both like the nature of modularity and uh, Legos that 
create these kinds of really valuable um, destinations in Web3. Uh, but also, again, like a lack of kind of some extrinsic motivation, you know, like I, it's a good question to ask, like how much value are the people who wrote Wyvern seeing out of Uniswap, I mean, OpenSea's uh, volumes, which is, which is something interesting to ask. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. So don't ask me, but ask someone, <laughs> see what they say. Uh, so that's that's what's going on with these proxy registries, and I, you know, I can be we can be fairly sure, given that it's Wyvern, I I know, a, you know, a little bit about them, and and uh, they're as I say, like widely used across the industry and and well audited. So it seems like the proxy stuff is uh, doing what OpenSea says it does, which is just uh, approving these meta transactions and allowing us to trade items easily against their marketplace contracts, um, and. It's always worth, as you know, like I'm a big fan of reading and technical documentation, which is what I've spent many years doing. Uh, the OpenSea docs are well written. And if you go and take a look at uh, not just the 721 um, example, which will walk you through most of what we're going to do today, uh, you can also take a look at the crowd sale uh, tutorials, which will allow you to see that not only can you kind of like deploy your own smart contracts, have total control over them and just proxy control over these meta transactions to the OpenSea exchange contracts. Uh, you can also in fact, write your own custom sale logic and they give you increasingly complex versions of that kind of custom sale logic, uh, which is interesting to think about. And you, you, don't, you don't have to rely on their uh, fairly simple kind of front end, which, in any case, gives you access to all sorts of different kinds of auctions. You can you can write your own unique logic, which is all documented there. Uh, so this was all of the stuff that was going through my mind when I was thinking about, okay, like, is it really worth uh, following the OpenSea tutorials and documentation and implementing their uh, suggested native meta transactions and uh, whitelisting their proxy. Uh, I, I think that for this example, it is. Uh, for some of my other work, perhaps not. Uh, it depends always on what your context is, as that is the thing that defines which trade-offs are best for you. Uh, but it's interesting, I suppose, to know about these kinds of things. It's interesting to know about Wyvern. It's a wonderful thing to learn about the difference between zeroth order and first order exchange. Uh, and for that reason, I think that like, it's wonderful too to have this kind of stuff in our contract. Um, the other thing that I want to just talk about a little bit, uh, we're not going to uh, go through every single line of code here, but these contracts are the same as what I have used for the Guardian NFTs in finding the blue book. And so they have a unique uh, addition of mine, which is this token URI updated method, which we'll look at now, and, and the event associated with it. Um, the, the reason why I've left this in is because it is so at odds with the general implementation of NFTs. You know, generally speaking, and it's something that we'll also talk about extensively today, you want your universal resource indicator, you want the thing in your NFT, which points to where the content associated with it is, to be immutable, right? That's the, that's the whole point of NFTs in, in, if you listen to some people, right? That's, uh, there are this permanent immutable, always the same JPEG or .wav file or whatever, you know? Uh, and uh, yeah, sure, you know, maybe, um, but for me, that's not the case, right? Like I wanted to write this book where the NFTs represented stewardship or guardianship over a chapter and, I wanted the people who hold those NFTs to be able to change what is what it is that they're guarding, right? Because like that in and of itself is an artistic statement that requires economic expression, right? And that, that was the kind of whole point of that particular project for me. And so, you know, because it's all open source and 
you can do what you want with the code, you know, like it's cool. I'm going to have a token URI updated method because why not? And that fits my needs. Um, so, you know, this kind of touches on what Sid was mentioning, I think in our first guild session that like we're so early and these standards are not to be taken as some kind of monolithic set in stone, never to be questioned authoritarian routine. They're suggestions, they're guidelines, you know, uh, and you shouldn't feel limited by that. Uh, you want to kind of use them to the extent that they enable what you need, whether it's from a marketplace perspective, whether it's from marketing and advertising and general awareness. Uh, but you do yourself a great service if you are clear about like the intention behind your projects and how that translates into specific things like this. You know, so if you take what we do today and implement your own contracts and run with your own stuff i recommend that you remove this right because uh it's unlikely that you would have the same requirements as i did for for the guardian nfts but it's just a nice example in production on mainnet uh of an nft contract that allows you to change the uri because you know why not um and that particular update token uri here is uh, a public function, but it does require that whoever sends the message that wants to update it is uh, indeed the owner of that token ID. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm limited in the language I can use in that function because this owner of thing comes from the 721 contract itself, which is a pity, but uh, we were not thinking perhaps as clearly then as we are now about ownership versus stewardship, guardianship other ways of speaking about and coding these things. Um, you can, you'll see like a lot of um, this keyword in our tradable contracts as well. Super, it's got to do with like one level up in the contract hierarchy. Uh, so that's like another thing to consider, which we haven't really touched in, in previous guild sessions is that like this here, what you inherit defines uh, an inheritance graph, a hierarchy uh, for, for your contract. And super means like sort of go one up or to the next relevant place in that hierarchy of contracts, all of which are linked together on chain. We looked at it a little bit in um, the, I wonder if it's in this contract. Uh, supports interface method, the ERC-165 that we touched on last uh, last session. And it also uses the super keyword to go and find the, the 165 uh, interface and make sure that it implements it correctly for ERC-721 and 721 in new rural contracts, uh, which we covered last week. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, these two last methods is approved for all and message.sender are just what we need for easy trading, easy trading and uh, information passing on OpenSea itself. It's also important to say that like having these particular functions in our contracts doesn't then mean that you can't go and also show your NFTs on Rarible or Super Rare or with Fund or Zora. They're, they're still classic NFT contracts. These two things just allow for uh, ease of use on OpenSea itself. It doesn't limit you to just using OpenSea. So that's another kind of advantage of these, these kinds of setups is that it's just because you have this code in your contracts and we now have a better understanding of what it actually is about and, and where it comes from. It doesn't mean that we're limited to OpenSea. It just means that we have uh, enabled the uh, best kind of capacities that OpenSea can provide for us for free in terms of the user interface. Uh, that was another kind of consideration in my own mind as I was going through whether I should implement this or not. Um, okay, so that's our new tradable contracts uh, along with some of OpenSea's infrastructure um, and Wyvern, which is great. Uh, I really like <laughs> went a long way down this rabbit hole when I was thinking about this kind of stuff, because you will see that like um, 
man, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to consider when you put this kind of code uh, into your contract. And, and again, like when you're deciding about the trade-offs between like, okay, do I just want a vanilla NFT contract that's going to be like a little bit more difficult to use at the end of the day? Or do I want to have these kinds of helper functions in my contract that allow for a very smooth user experience at the end? Uh, that trade-off is a difficult one to navigate because again, like if you go and hang out in the open Zeppelin repos, which I sometimes do, you'll see that like they had some problems when they were upgrading their library uh, to the from 3.4.0 to the current 4.0 one that we're using. Um, because this thing that we've just looked at that is approved for all uh, it's kind of meant, you know, it, it's, it's kind of meant to be overloaded, but it actually doesn't have any effects on the contract behavior. <laughs> there's, there's like a lot of stuff in this issue, which you really like, oh my God, you know, this is just, <laughs> holy moly. Uh, the, the OpenSea guys did not do a particularly good job of uh, implementing this stuff the first time around. And uh, that use of super in this is approved for all function was not actually behaving as it was expected to. Um, and happily, uh, this issue has been closed and we can be sure that our version of the um, open Zeppelin libraries, which we can just go and check, is 4.3.2. So we're definitely okay because it was the upgrade to 4.0 that made this change and that allowed for the correct sort of behavior with our um, OpenC proxy, but you can see that like because of the way they implemented their proxy, OpenZF then actually had to go and like change uh, some implementation in their contract, which is just kind of interesting and has happened. But that's uh, yeah, I spent days, <laughs> days and days and days thinking about this particular thing. Uh, I do think that it's like worth knowing about, as I say, like it depends on your own context whether you want to use OpenC's infrastructure or not. But I. I appreciate the fact that they use Wyvern. I think that it's a great protocol. I think that the ability to whitelist a proxy without hampering your ability to list your NFTs elsewhere and have access to better sort of user experience on OpenSea, as well as the fact that you can, in addition to sort of whitelisting their proxy, write your own custom sales logic uh, is, you know, those are very attractive features. Um, Again, they're not completely unique to OpenSea and Zora in, in particular is doing some great work, uh, but OpenSea are the longest living, well, not the longest living, but they've kind of been the most successful. They have the biggest team and the most money to kind of build interesting and robust infrastructure and tools. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we are in the ecosystem at the moment, it's probably going to be outdated uh, soon given some of the uh, scandal that has been around OpenSea and insider trading uh, that's happened recently, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, the next thing, as I said, that we're going to want to do is just to quickly update our Babel contract because we've gone and put all of the tradable logic into this new contract. All that we're going to need in our Babel contract is just a constructor that tells us about its name and symbol and where the proxy address is, and then. Uh, some function to declare like where the contract universal resource indicator is, uh, where, the, where the metadata file that has all of the information relevant to the contract, not the NFTs in the contract, but the contract itself. Uh, that, that's kind of all we want in our, in our Babel contract. So if you copy that, uh, go to your Babel contract, delete everything that's in there, and just uh, paste it here. You can see it's now simpler you know we don't have any of the mincing functionality or whatever we were dealing with uh in the previous skill session here just this constructor and a contract uri uh which expects some some url uh that we sort of permanently store metadata to do with the contract at uh you can see that i've sort of hinted that we're going to be using our weave i have reasons for choosing that as well and we'll come and put in the URL here in a moment. Um, so our contracts are now ready, 
right? Uh, we have everything that we need in our contracts repo to have fully functional production ready contracts on mainnet using OpenSea. Everything at a contractual level is set up. What we're going to need to do now is to update our tasks and our tests uh, to handle all of the new stuff that we've put in. And once those are ready, then we can uh, speak a little bit about our weave and think about deploying something on Rinkeby. So uh, as I say, we, we, we sort of gonna take a look at our tasks first to make sure that we can actually deploy the stuff correctly and perhaps uh, look at some operations that we can run against our new tradable contracts. And it will make sense as to why I structured the task directly like I did last week. Um, the first thing that we want wanting to do is uh, just sort of rework our deploy task um, to take cognizance of this new proxy registration, uh, this new proxy address that we're, we're using for OpenSea and uh, the effect that it will have on how we deploy our contracts, which now uh, expects us, if you take a look here, they expect an argument, this proxy address. So we're going to have to change how we do our deployments. If you come into your deploy task, you will see there's these two lines here, which is about declaring the network. And I, I want you to replace those uh, by declaring your proxy registration address, getting the network, logging it. And uh, if we're going to be using Rinkeby, then instead of the main net, proxy address, which is what we've just been looking at uh, on Etherscan, then there's a Rinkeby proxy address, which is also available in their docs. And I just put it here for your own delight and convenience. Um, we'll also need to um, change one other thing, which is this deployment line here, because it's expecting an argument when it gets deployed rather than just nothing. Uh, you just need to put your proxy registration address in there because that's what Babel is expecting when it gets deployed. Uh, if you have red in your terminal as a result of this ethos thing, don't worry about it. Uh, it's just, uh, I don't know, VS Code being weird. I, honestly, I couldn't figure out why uh, why ethos was not available in the hard, time, hard hat runtime environments. Uh, but the deployment tasks work, so uh, that's what we should expect at least. Uh, we've now put in our new network and proxy and uh, updated our uh, deployment line. So we should be able to compile our contracts and see if they deploy into a local network. Uh, so let's see if that happens. We're again going to tell our TypeScript modules not to transpile anything. And for those of you wondering what transpile is as opposed to compile, transpile just means uh, take everything from TypeScript and render it into JavaScript. And then from JavaScript, it gets compiled. Uh, so transpile is like moving from one human readable language to another. Compiled is moving from a human readable language down to machine code. Um, so hopefully we should be able to compile some stuff. Uh, you'll see some messages in your terminal. Uh, because we cleaned up everything at the beginning of the session. And our type chain repo has, I mean, directory has appeared and our artifacts directory has reappeared. So that's really good. Seems like the compilation has been successful. Uh, very excited about that. And if you're still with me, we can deploy our newly compiled contracts uh, onto our local network. So let's uh, see if npx hard hat deploy works as expected, given our new deployments task here. There we go. That's ex exactly what we're expecting. We know that uh, the network name is going to be unknown when we're defaulting to hard hat, which we defined last week in our config, if you remember. Our default network is hard hat. Um, that's wonderful. And we have our deployer address, some random one that we're pulling in over here uh, from hard hat ethers and our contract address. 
which is perfect. Uh, and if you read uh, the repo, you'll see that I ask you just to keep this safe, uh, your your local contract address, because we might uh, we might refer back to it later on. So it seems like our deployment task works. There wasn't too much to do to update it. So we just uh, put our proxy registration address in, put in this little if block to handle uh, the case where we're deploying it to Rinkaby. Uh, it doesn't really matter that our proxy address is set to the mainnet address locally because that's just our own train. So that should be fine. And we updated our deploy uh, method to uh, pass in the proxy registration address as an argument, which is what our contracts are now expecting, given this trade-off that we've decided to make. Um, the next thing that we're going to want to do, uh, once we have uh, copied our deployed address, uh, is write our tests, right? So again, last week, we spent a fair bit of time talking about chai and waffle, this notion of um, sort of describing uh, the thing that you're testing. Uh, so for instance, we begin with a top level describe block about the contracts, which is Babel. And before each test that we run, we're gonna do some stuff, which is like get some accounts as signers. We're going to deploy uh, Babel itself. Um, you can see that we've sort of passing in the proxy registration. That's so again, we're gonna one, run one little expect, which is that it's gonna have a proper address, i.e. that it's been properly deployed. And then we're going to have a whole bunch of these different describe blocks that describe we're testing, that describe what we're testing. So this is the deployment series of tests. This is the minting series of tests. This is the updating series of tests, uh, which you'll probably want to remove if you're uh, a little bit more sane than me. Batch minting, burning, all of this kind of stuff. And once you've described the function in your contract that you're going to be testing, then you have lower level it, as in it should do this, or I expect it to perform this functionality and not that functionality. Uh, and you can see that here in minting, for instance, you can have multiple different it should do stuff blocks uh, in one describe. So as I say, like testing is kind of sexy, to be honest, like if you're into this kind of stuff, <laughs> very cool way of, um, of writing code and and as I said last week, like when you write your tests, not only do you understand in a much more intuitive sense the language of defense, there's also few better feelings in all of development than seeing a bunch of green ticks in your terminal as all of your tests pass. So if you copy this particular block from the readme and go back to your uh, code editor, in your test directory, there's the Babel tests from last week. You can just control A to select it all and delete it and paste our new tests. Um, so that's kind of what we're expecting. Um, let's look. Uh, just make sure that's, that's what we want, which it is. Um, you can see that we discussed uh, at the very end of last week's session the zero address, which is where, uh, by convention only, not by the standard, uh, new tokens are minted from out of the black hole, the uh, Sagittarius at the heart of our Milky Way. Um, and we've added our proxy registration address, which, if you look carefully, is in fact the one on Rinkaby. Um, just because it might be nice to run tests on Rinkaby. Uh, before we deploy anything to mainnet. And again, it doesn't matter where that address points to on our local host because uh, it's just for testing purposes. Um, we've kind of been over the deployment describe block. Nothing has changed here. We're just expecting the name and symbol to be what we define them as in our Babel contracts, which is Babel and lib. So that checks out. Uh, our minting. Uh, also, it hasn't really changed that much, right? Uh, we're declaring an ID, which is, it begins at zero um, because we're now using the enumerable uh, thing, not just a URI storage extension from last week. Uh, so you might notice that that's changed from a one to a zero. We're using our beautiful kernel heart as the token URI. 
And then in our it's block, we're saying it should mint a new book when anyone calls it, which definitely is what we're expecting because uh, if you come back up here, this safe, uh, safe mints is, uh, huh. it shouldn't be, it should not be on there now. Okay, I might have to change this test. Uh, I mean, the test definitely passes because I've checked them, but uh, this is, yeah, when the owner calls it, um, let me just change that on the fly. So when the owner calls it, it's some asynchronous function. Um, what we're going to do here is using our await keyword, we're going to connect to our contract with our deployer, uh, who is the owner. And we're going to call the safe mint function that I've just looked at and realized that I wrote the description of the test incorrectly. Um, and we're going to pass into our safe mint function the other dot address. Remember in our tests, we define both a deployer address and an other address so that we can test different stuff. Uh, so we're gonna, this is the to address in our safemint function and the URI that we've declared uh, up here. Then we expect that test to emit a transfer from the zero address to the to address that we defined with the token ID that is up here, which is exactly the same test as we had in last week's uh, tutorial. So that should, pass as we expect it. Uh, we expect the set token URI to pass when we connect with the, to, to the contract with the deployer accounts. Uh, and when we connect to the contract with the other accounts, we expect the set token URI to be reverted with this specific message, right? So let's go and just check that we understand why we write the test in that way. If you look at the set token URI, method, it's also protected by this only owner modifier. Uh, and it's looking at some set token URI, which if you all remember, requires a very brief digression into our uh, open Zeppelin token ELC721 extension URI storage, uh, which says set token URI, um, and there it is, right? So I actually did not uh, check this just before. And it's interesting that the message is different. Um, I'm not 100% sure why that's the case. If maybe I look at the ERC721, there's perhaps a set token URI method in here which there is not, that's kind of interesting. Um, so there's something for you. <laughs> I'm not actually sure why this test uh, uses a different, uh, again, I, I, I wrote them, but uh, it's interesting that, uh, oh, you know what? Okay, I actually do understand this particular uh, revert call is not coming from my, yeah, C721 URI storage contracts. It's coming from my ownable contracts, uh, which I do need to show you because I want to show you how we come to these messages. Uh, here we go. When, uh, there we go. When the only owner modifier fails, uh, which is what's going to happen in this particular test when we try to connect to our contract and call a method that is protected by the only owner modifier, then it's going to be this particular message from ownable call is not the owner. That uh, is what we're expecting this thing to be reverted with. Uh, and this should also give you some insight into why Open Zeppelin have structured their error messages, their, their require or revert messages in this way, because it actually tells you the name of the contract that it's coming from. Uh, <laughs> so you don't have to be an idiot like me and go looking in the wrong contracts. You can actually just tell when you're writing tests um, where you're expecting the, uh, the failure call to happen, which in this case is our ownable contract. Uh, then we also can just like check some other stuff from this minting action, which is that we expect the balance of this other address to equal one because we minted a token to it. Uh, we expect the owner of the token ID 
to be that other address. Uh, and we expect the token URI of the token ID that we defined up here um, to be equal to the token URI there. So that's just checking that everything does work logically. And then another it block in our minting um, describe block is talking about other accounts ought not to be able to mint tokens. So if we have exactly the same logic as we had over here, uh, this one, uh, then when we connect with our other accounts to Babel and try to safe mint, uh, then again, it gets rejected by the only owner modifier, uh, which is there. It's to be reverted with, which is this nice sort of shorthand provided by Waffle. Um, the same thing kind of happens with uh, our uh, updating method. We do like a very, very similar thing with an it block setting up our token ID, our new our token URI, and then a new token URI. Uh, we mint things first. We expect the transfer event to be fired. Uh, we then, and we mint it to the other address. Uh, then we connect our contract with that other address and we call the update token URI function, which we expect to be successful. So it's going to emit an event token URI updated which is uh, the event that I showed you up here. There it is. Um, and with those specific arguments, and if we connect with our deployer accounts, which is not the owner of this uh, particular token <coughs> because we've minted it to our other address and we call the update token URI, then we're gonna expect that to be reverted with uh, ERC721 tradable. Caller is not the owner of this token. So that tells me that it's in the ERC 721 tradable uh, contract where it is. And if I look, there is the error message that I'm expecting if the message sender is not the holder of the token. So, um, Andy, just let me know, let us know maybe if there's a, a good place to pause a couple of questions in the chat. That is, this is a good place to pause because I'm not going to speak about the rest of the tests. There's some other stuff to go through. Okay, okay. Um, Perhaps one practical one from SIDCode was um, a TypeScript specific warning for proxy registration address. Um, not sure if Sid, you wanna, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, yeah, I just get a warning for proxy re registration address. Uh, I've pasted the warning in my message. Let's... Okay. Um, let's just uh, give that a moment, Sid, because I think that we might come to it uh, in in a second, uh, if if you don't mind. Uh, I, I I think that I know what it is. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit difficult to tell just on the fly uh, exactly where that's coming from. And I think that it might have to do with, uh, we're gonna run these tests now and then, I wonder if you, um, huh, proxy registration, that, I don't actually know. Um, Get the chat to reappear, which I never can. Let's just stop sharing. So you've got it compiling, deploying the tests pass. Yeah, so my tests pass, it compiles and deploys. And what are you, where are you getting this warning? In which step the compile, deploy, or test? Uh, no, uh, just in the VS code. I think it's a VS code specific uh, thing uh, okay. and I'm getting it in both uh, deploy.ts and one more one more file. Yeah, so, I think that it might be because we're not uh, declaring it's typed correctly. Is, is it in your tests or your tasks? Yeah, I'm getting it on this line, um, wherever proxy registration address is used. The one that I just shared. Uh, 
for me, see, you know, it's always kind of fun to see if we can solve this stuff on the fly. Um, we're going to go and have a look see at Holly's contracts, uh, which I cannot find. Because um, uh, she might have declared the type properly. Um, why can I not find this? This is also the problem. <laughs> Sorry about this. So, okay. for you, I opened another application. Let's see if we can find the problem. If you take a look in this task. So Holly is still not declaring her type properly. Uh, how about... Let's take a look here. Um, Yeah, she's removed the open sea meta transactions. So actually, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure. So like, I think you just have to declare the type correctly, which on the fly, like I'm not exactly positive about how to do so. Maybe I can just uh, follow up with you in the Slack chat afterwards. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's we are using VAR var, so TypeScript is just confused about that. Yeah. It's not, it's expecting a string, but it's getting something else. I'll follow up with you in the, in the Slack yeah. chat after this. Sorry yeah. About that. Yeah. Are there other questions before we carry on? Mine was just about documentation in general and like your personal take on like writing comments within the code or just like a separate markdown file so you don't forget like what you wrote and stuff. Like what's your general best practice recommendation? My general best practice recommendation is to comment everything and in the code. <laughs> um, what, what you'll find here, I, we, we, I think we spoke about it in the first guild session uh, in particular um, in the open Zeppelin libraries, which are always like best practices. If you go into like any of these token contracts, but we'll just look at 721 because like that's what we're working with. All of these are NAT spec comment, which means natural language specification. Uh, and NAT spec comments are how you, certainly when you're writing smart contracts, like I would say it's almost a prerequisite because like NAT spec is supported by a lot of wallets. And so like a lot of the things that you write in your NAT spec code can actually be shown to the end user as well. So it's not just about like readability for other developers and potential auditors. It can have an effect on user experience. Uh, and that's really wonderful. So NetSpec, it's well documented also in like solidity.read the docs. Uh, you can go and like read, read more about NetSpec there. Um, and then like for your own sanity in uh, like your tests and other stuff that we're running through here, like you really should, uh, you know, like maybe like I, honestly, I, Aaron, I mean, I find like the tests to be fairly self-explanatory. So like, unless there's like, specific things on like particular kind of contract calls about like why things would fail uh, that you might want to put in like maybe you can get away with like not commenting your tests so much but certainly in like deployments and these kinds of things it's well worth having comments which i haven't put in here just because like uh yeah like i didn't i didn't quite have the time <laughs> uh, but generally speaking 
I would comment and comment a lot and in the code is my preference. Um, if I can play a bit of devil's advocate to that. Um, <laughs> I think oftentimes too, uh, comments don't get uh, updated and maintained. And so if you add a lot of comments, um, it can happen that those comments get outdated. And then for future engineers coming into the code, they may be misleading to what the code is actually doing. So my usual take on that is making sure that my variables are being specific, my codes are being, my tests are being um, documented so that the tests sort of serve as those uh, comments rather than um, avoiding to use comments as much as I can. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's fair enough. It's probably a good, uh, good points. Yeah. So like, we, yeah, I would comment everything in a smart contract and then uh, maybe follow Juliet's advice. Uh, as I said, like the tests do describe a lot of stuff. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> engineers are terrible about updating comments. I'm very much agree with Juliet on that. So it's probably, probably a good point. I mean, I'll just say that it's an incentive design thing. Like in a company or a closed org, um, then there's not much incentive to document stuff. But if you're writing code as a public good, uh, you want to tell the story in as much detail as possible. So if you look at Scaffold Death or any of the um, widely popular open source software libraries, they are quite documented in detail. It might also just be worth asking, you know, who would be like a good resource for this is Henry Zhu, who's the maintainer for Babel. And he's uh, funny, <laughs> not this Babel, the actual JavaScript library. Um, he's, he's the maintainer for that and he's, he's in block form. So it might be worth getting his opinion as well. Uh, we'll, we'll ask him, I'll ping him after this. Um, Okay, so those are the tests. Um, there are a few other to do with uh, sort of batch minting um, and burning, which it's just quick, quickly worth looking at the burning one. Again, we, excuse me, we mint uh, uh, a token and then we assign the owner as our other address. We connect it with our other address and we burn it using the token ID we expect, we expect that to succeed, therefore emit an event called transfer from the other address back to the black hole with that token ID. And then we expect its balance to go back to zero. Um, and we expect this particular owner of call to fail in our 721 contract itself with this message on a query for non-existent token. And we expect the total supply to go back to zero. So. Uh, that's wonderful. And we also write similar tests, except this time connecting it from connecting to the contract from an account, which is not the owner of the token calling burn. And it's going to be reverted with uh, this function called to a non-contract account. And this is like badly, uh, a badly commented, a badly written uh, thing, which so it probably comes from the contract that we've Put together ourselves, uh, which it actually doesn't. Uh, huh. That's kind of funny. Uh, and if we go and take a look, Intel override. Hmm. So yeah, that's probably also in uh, in our Open Zeppelin library, which I, I don't want to go back into now. But uh, there's some other things that I want to get to. And I want to just check that our hard hat tests do pass. So NPX hard hat test will get us, hopefully, a bunch of green ticks in our terminal. Um, you can see deployment minting, batch minting, burning, seven tests passing. Everything is hunky dory. It's exactly as we expect. Uh, even for this particularly strange comment there that doesn't follow the convention of the rest, which we can go and fix uh, after this guild session. Uh, so you will see that like we've updated our deployments uh, and deployed locally. Also, when you checked out this branch at the beginning of the session, you would have got these other operations uh, tasks and an updated task names file, um, which if we go back here. 
you can see that these operations, um, this is the reason that we set up our tasks directory in the way that we have, because this is what I'm talking about in terms of like uh, modularity and just like the logical separation of stuff in our code so that it's more easily navigable and readable and understandable for other people. So we can write specific operation tasks for like batch minting a token, for burning a token, for minting a token. All of the stuff we can run directly from our terminal and have a whole bunch of things happen on a network of our choice. Uh, and they operate in much the same way as our current deploy task, except uh, you know, instead of just kind of deploying the contract, they uh, call particular functions on it. Uh, and in this way, you can see that like here, we're sort of declaring a contract object. Uh, we're declaring our hard hat runtime environments, looking at the contract, getting its ABI as well as the deployer accounts, and then looking for something called a receipt. And that's going to come by awaiting the response when we connect our contract with our deployer accounts and call a specific function. In this case, because it's the mint token operation, we're going to call safe mint an address that we want to mint it to, which we're going to define in our environment variables, whatever metadata we want to pass to it and some gas, uh, which is what we need to call uh, stuff in a contract, submit a transaction onto the network. So this operates in much the same way as, uh, as our deployment task with a little bit more complexity in terms of just not only deploying the contract, but uh, calling particular functions on it. And this should give you like the pattern that you need in order to write any kinds of uh, tasks for any kind of contract that you're working on. So if you just use what's going on here, you should be able to connect to whatever contract and whatever function you like and, and off you go. Uh, the gas limit here is uh, enough for most calls if you're doing something really uh, complicated, then you might uh, see this kind of task fail. Uh, and it's one of the best places to go looking for why it would be this gas limit, which is uh, you know, part of the um, globally available variables. You know, you have like message.sender, message.data, message.value, message.gas. Uh, and, and that's what this is plugging into. So there are three different operations that you get the mint token, the burn token, and the batch mint token. Um, your task names has been updated. And the last thing that we need to do is add a few more dev dependencies and update our config file. So uh, if you, I think that I've already added these, uh, but you can grab this um, and run it. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully my computer doesn't fall over when I try and do this. Um, you can see that the things that we're installing here is something called .env, which is what's going to allow us to work with our .env file that specifies env environment variables in a safe manner that you don't have to you know, you can see that there's some really sort of scary stuff in this file, like private keys, and you never, ever, ever want to commit this to GitHub. So the way that we like work with this kind of stuff, you know, because like when we're working locally, we can just use that hard hat ethers module to kind of get a signer with address and we don't have to worry about it. But of course, when you're deploying stuff onto Rinkeby or onto mainnet, you actually need an account which has ETH in it to pay for those transactions on those networks. Hence, you need, uh, to sort of provide the keys that uh, allow for the software to sign the transactions. Uh, doing that is kind of a pain and having a .env file is the way that we get around that. Uh, and we also really make sure that this is part of our .get, it, .get ignore, which is the file which specifies everything in our local directory, which will be ignored when we commit stuff to GitHub. You never, ever, ever, ever want to commit this kind of file uh, to GitHub because if you give away your private keys, uh, that's it. And, and there are people who run scrapers against GitHub looking for this kind of stuff because it does sometimes happen. So be careful. Um, 
We've also installed the hard hat gas reporter, which will help us with gas estimations, potentially if you write more complicated tasks than we're going to do today. And we've uh, the solidity coverage tool, which is uh, what's going to help us um, see how much of our contract code our tests actually cover, which in this particular example is not a lot, uh, but Hopefully, if you use it and become familiar with the way in which it works, you can get 100% coverage, particularly for your contracts, which is what we're looking for. Um, then you have a new config file just based on these, uh, these new inputs and our environment file, uh, environment variables. So if you copy that and go back to hardhat.config.ts, you can again just replace everything that's in this file you'll see that uh, we've got our new operational tasks that we've imported, our new uh, .env and Solidity coverage and hard hat gas reporter modules, uh, a whole bunch of stuff about environment variables. And then we've kind of extended our user config. So instead of just declaring the Solidity compiler version, we've also enabled the optimizer uh, with a specific number of runs. This optimizer is important to be aware of because it results in slight differences with the uh, hex code that you actually put on chain. So if you're going to verify your contracts on Etherscan, it's one of the options that you have to select and be aware of because there are differences to compiling your code with the optimizer running or not. And then we've implemented uh, a coverage network for uh, Solidity coverage, Rinkaby, which expects some private key, and Mainnet, which also expects some private key, and an Infura API key. Uh, and then Etherscan, because we can actually do, uh, it's one of the really neat features of Hardhat, which works really well, and I'm delighted about it, because it is important to verify your contracts, and it has been quite difficult traditionally in the past. but Happily, from hard hat, you can verify your contracts uh, with a very simple command uh, right from here in your local environment. And that's very, very beneficial. So that's what the Etherscan API key is for, uh, is for verification of your contracts directly from your local environment, which I think is enormously cool and worthwhile. Um, if you don't, you can just uh, delete that, this particular block and uh, the Etherscan API key there, and you don't have to worry about it. So we're now ready. Uh, that's that's really it. Um, you know, we've got everything that we need. We've updated our config file. Uh, the very last thing that we're going to have to do is just set up our environment file. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, just rename this to. You can just take off the dot sample. Uh, or you can copy it and paste it uh, and call it .env. And this is where I'm going to need you to fill in um, an Infura API key, an Etherscan API key, your local host address, which if you remember, we left in our uh, deploy task. So I'm just gonna put that in there because this is kind of the form. Uh, and the things that I'm looking for you to put in are an Infura API key, an Etherscan API key, uh, some private key for Rinkaby and Mainnet, and a Mint2 address, which is just your, uh, it's just your Ethers, your, uh, your account here, uh, which you can, you can get if you need to put it there. So I can put in my Mint2 address and my localhost contract address without giving anything away. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and uh, just fill in the rest of these things uh, quickly, which shouldn't take too long. Uh, if I put in my key, the scan key. Um, happily, my Private keys are a long, long way away. So you just need to give me a moment to go and find those. Um, 
and then we're going to live a very dangerous thing. Um, start sharing my screen again without uh, looking at that .n file. So you should have what you need in your in your .n file in terms of the inferior key, your private keys. You can use the same for Rinkeby and, and mainnet as long as you have a uh, an account on Rinkeby which has some ETH in it. You can get your private key from from MetaMask pretty easily and just put it in there. It should be like a string uh, and your ETH scan key. Uh, so those are the things that we sort of uh, needed, and then. Uh, once we've got those few things in, we can just test locally whether these new uh, operations that I've given you in this uh, particular lesson, if they work. Uh, so if we run npx hard hat mint token and we have to pass some metadata URI, which I'm gonna look at now and uh, we can kind of explain what's going on there. Um, but here you can see that uh, this is sort of, when we look at our mint token task, uh, which I explained just now, you can see that we're kind of passing it some metadata URI, which is an Rweave uh, setup. Uh, it sort of logs our deployer address locally, uh, the contract address locally, which comes from my environment variable, my mint to address, which I've also put in. And then this is the receipt that I was talking about when we were looking at that file. If, uh, if we sort of go back uh, and look at my mint operation, this is the receipt that we're kind of interested in. And we're logging that to a console and we're taking a look at all of the very beautiful hexadecimal data, which uh, is going on when we have minted a token successfully. Uh, you can kind of... Uh, Look at it yourself. Um, there is not too much to tell from kind of like first looking at it, apart from the fact that it was indeed successful uh, and has data associated with it. The likes of which we would largely expect. You can kind of see my mint two address is there. Uh, you know, it matches that. So that's kind of the first little bits. This is the first four bytes of the kekak256 hash of the function safe mint. Uh, so this is this is how like the data, when you call a transaction, this is how the data actually works. We've covered this a little bit in the other Solidity Guild, but you get zero X, then the first four bytes of the kekak256 hash of the function. Uh, so safe mint in this case, padded to uh, 32 bytes and then concatenated with all of the other parameters that are passed to this function. So in this case, this is the two address that it's expecting. Uh, then the that four I assume should be the uh, token ID. And then this string over here should represent the metadata URI that we've passed in hexadecimal format. So that's kind of what's going on there if you're curious about how data is actually arranged and how the EVM knows like what function uh, to go and find and execute stuff on. It's all, it's all caught up in this data field, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then the last thing that we wanted to test before we speak uh, for the last 20 minutes of that, uh, our weave and permanent storage is that we can indeed burn the token. Here we don't need to pass a metadata URI, just the token ID that we want to burn. Uh, and again, this is just happening locally and we're just testing that. Uh, this is kind of what we expect. We're burning token with uh, ID zero. The contract address is there. The deployer address is the same because it's all local. And again, here are the first four bytes of the kgac 256 hash of the function. Uh, Pad it to zero and it's it should be zero because it's uh, index zero. So that kind of makes sense. Uh, the RMS are some other things that we can talk about another day. They have to do with signatures um, and how that those happen on Ethereum. But I would prefer to spend the last 20 minutes talking about our weave. Um, and 
just to kind of take a look very briefly at what is actually this, uh, what is this <laughs> that we're kind of looking at? Uh, so our weave happily provides um, a convenient web portal through which you can look at any kind of our weave string like the one that we just had. So our weave.net and then you put whatever string is there. So this is what we've actually, this is the metadata associated with the NFT that we just minted and burned locally actually is. And you can see here that there's a description. It's book one in our library of Babel called Ode to Joy, isn't that nice? It's got a number of different trays, which uh, you, know, you can see on OpenSea has this, this notion of trays associated with different NFTs, which we're kind of plugging into called one pages, there's 121 pages in this book, we called another one joy. <laughs> it's more than 10, uh, 11 out of 10. The celebration is 10 out of 10. Uh, and then other attributes, uh, which sort of uh, have to do with being grateful in an overflowing fashion. Uh, there are also some external URL associated with it, some image and name, as is generally the case for these kinds of NFTs. Uh, this is like, Basically, if you forget the attributes, description, external URL, image, and name is basically the minimum that OpenSea uh, kind of requires to display something about your NFT. Uh, and if we go and look at this other uh, URL, you'll see that, hey, it's actually the HTML file for the first chapter of finding the blue book because that was easy. And if I look at the image um, associated with this NFT that we've been messing around with locally, uh, then I will see that it is a kernel learning image. Oh, that's so nice. So we're learning lots. Uh, this is the metadata associated with it. Where does this metadata come from? Well, you'll see that the other thing that you got when you checked out this particular branch was one, um, an assets folder with two files and the one is the one file has to do with our top level description of the contract this is what we're going to uh, deploy onto our weave and put into our actual smart contracts uh, the metadata associated with this and then this is what we've just been looking at the book one uh, json file that describes all of the metadata associated with our first nft um, now, in order to describe exactly what's going on here, I need to uh, talk a little bit about Arweave, um, which is a really incredible protocol. Um, and again, not the only one that you can potentially use for permanent data storage. Uh, in fact, there are a few of them. We've had many of the people that are sort of are responsible for creating these protocols uh, speak at kernel in module three. So we had Jean Benet first up, and then we had David Varick and Manasi uh, from SIA. They run something, SIA is responsible for something called Skynet, which is kind of like a mutable, uh, but also interestingly permanent database. And SIA is a very interesting network. And then we had Sam Williams from Arweave come and speak with us. Now, I was hoping to have a little bit more time, but I'll keep this as brief as I can. The reason that I went with Arweave for my own work and for this tutorial is because I really, really, really like this adaptive mechanism design that they have. This notion of adaptive interacting incentive agents, which I'll speak a little bit about here. The IPFS approach is to have something called proof of space time, which, you know, to give them their due is like hands down the coolest name for a consensus algorithm that there is. <laughs> so like, wonderful, thank you, IPFS. Um, and what they mean by that is that you have to have sort of proof of storage space over time. And this sort of gets implemented with kind of random challenges uh, to make sure that you are storing the data that you claim to be storing. Um, which is interesting and it's, you know, like Filecoin and these kinds of things have implemented it fairly well. There's been like a little bit of difficulty around 
uptake there. And I think that one of the reasons, the deep seated reasons that we're seeing that kind of thing happen is because like for these kinds of systems, which are about permanent data and not, they're much more about data than, than sort of uh, transactions, right? Which is really where Bitcoin kind of began and Ethereum grew out of. I think that the nature of the incentive games to be played and the design space is slightly different. And I think that Aweave have done an incredible job. If you read this, this is their yellow paper and they describe their adaptive incentive mechanism from page 40 onwards. Uh, and you will see that like they speak first about like having adaptability in your protocols. Uh, originally, HTTP is purely intended for transfer of a web of knowledge, but it's come to sort of drive almost all movements of name address content on the web. It's just everything. Um, and what AIIA, this adaptive interacting incentive agents is about, is can we create a game that incentivizes people, uh, that, that incentivizes incentives? <laughs> we play this meta game with one another, right? And, and that sounds a little bit complex at first, but when you think about the definition of infinite games, infinite players are they, those who play with boundaries. And this is what the iWeave team is kind of talking about. They've taken the uh, tit for tat strategy implemented by BitTorrent in response to uh, a particular method that came about on the network, on the BitTorrent network called BitTyrant, which kind of just leached everything and seeded nothing. And they have generalized that tit for tat method that BitTorrent came up with for like pro social mechanisms in general. It's it's mind bogglingly cool, and not many people like are necessarily. Uh, deeply aware of what's going on because it's buried, you know, 40 pages into their yellow paper after a lot of other technical stuff about how the weave works. But this is the coolest part of this paper by a long stretch, right? If you just uh, take a look here, like, um, yeah, this pattern of rewarding pro social behavior reciprocally can be viewed as a generalization of BitTorrent's optimistic tit for tat algorithm from bandwidth sharing to generally useful behaviors. It's I know it's in like technical language, the most astonishing sentence I've read in a yellow paper since Ethereum. It's, it's really remarkable, right? Uh, and the reason that that kind of thing is so exciting is because like they're not talking about, you know, like on a blockchain network, for instance, right? Uh, you have everybody has to sort of play by the same rules, in this case, like proof of work, no double spending. But like in an adaptive in interacting incentivized agents game, each player within the network can essentially be playing a different game, right? Their ranking mechanism for other players and their agents within the meta game. So like the, the, the rules are not about uh, consensus per se. The only rules are about like everybody can implement their own strategy in terms of ranking other players and ranking those players' actions. And we don't make the rankings completely clear to everybody. There's a little bit of fuzziness um, in terms of like being able to, to, to determine why you have a specific rank. And what that means is instead of like playing these like finite consensus games, we can play infinite consensus games because anybody can write any kind of incentive strategy to try and uh, optimize their like profit from the network. Um, and the best example that they kind of give of this kind of thing is building IPFS bridges, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but it's also like, it's well worth kind of reading this particular paragraph where they talk about like how BitTorrents responded to BitTyrant and how this represents like an adaptive incentivized intera interacting incentivized agent metagame. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know, I, I, I can't speak too much more about this, but it's really, really interesting to go and take a look at. Um, and these AIIA games allow network participants to build agents that apportion their own resources, that they receive the highest net utility from other agents in the game. And as a trade-off to one, offer small incentives for node operators to exhibit a bias towards nodes they, nodes they believe are acting in a pro-social manner. So the idea is like, how can we create this game that incentivizes people to incentivize pro-social behavior? And, and that incentivizes to incentivize step is, it sounds complicated in natural language, but it's pure genius as far as I'm concerned at the level of code. And 
uh, that he had talked about like what this looks like in terms of having, for instance, an IPFS bridge when you're running an R-weave node, which is not of net benefit to you, but if everybody is doing that, then that becomes a dominant strategy on the network. And if you think back to Nikki Case's game of trust, you know, once you have enough cooperating agents on a network that tends to uh, kind of, you know, move the circle quicker and quicker and quicker towards like increasingly pro-social behaviors. I, it's just, it's, it's enormously cool. I can't say enough good things about this. There's a whole simulation section. And if you scroll um, sort of further on, you'll see that they outline like some of the problems with this, right? Uh, which is that uh, it can only encourage the expression of behavior that the majority of network participants favor. So it's also like open to sort of 51% like attacks. If the majority of your network is not pro-social, you're not going to get pro-social behavior out of this kind of setup. Um, it's uh, it, it cannot be used to sort of shift the consensus mechanism itself, which is an interesting trade-off that they've made. And um, it it can be fairly slow. Uh, it can it can be fairly slow. Basically, Change, changing the behavior across the whole network can can be fairly slow. But when you're R weave and you're talking about data permanence like being fairly slow is not so much of a problem and it makes sense that they would make that kind of trade-off. So I'm a very, very big fan of, of this particular aspect of, of our weave. I don't have much to say about the weave versus content addressable stuff uh, on IPFS and, and the networking protocols, the way that uh, you sort of are rooted towards information in the weave versus on the interplanetary file system. Uh, but I do for sure think that the our weave incentive mechanism is much more interesting and ought to be spoken of more widely in the space because it's just fascinating. Um, if you have an Arweave account uh, and you would like to experiment with this kind of stuff, please uh, drop your uh, Arweave, you, can, you should have like a, a little browser extension. And if you, uh, grab your wallet address and drop it in the chat. I will send you some Rweave so that you can play around with these kinds of things and, and deploy your own stuff. Because the last thing that I need to answer is, okay, like, cool, this is the JSON file, I get that. And like, here it is on Rweave, great. How did we get it there? <laughs> uh, and I did it with uh, a really cool little Rweave deploy tool which you can get for yourself. Uh, and then you just need to do a little bit of setup with your Rweave key and you can upload any piece of data that you would like to Rweave permanently. And that's another really interesting feature, right? Is that like with IPFS, because of the way that the incentive design structures the whole system, in order to really have permanent data on IPFS, you have to host it yourself, right? Or pay somebody to host it for you. Uh, and on Rweave, because of the nature of this AIIA stuff, you pay a once-off fee at the beginning, and that's it. You know, and, and you have a, you know, like as long as Rweave is there, that data will be there. And in my opinion, from the like kind of social level of reality, uh, you have a stronger guarantee on that data than IPFS provides because of the nature of this incentive mechanism, which is totally fascinating to me. Uh, that that the incentives define so much of, uh, I think, long-term use. I, I could be very wrong about this as well, but, but that's just my intuition. Uh, I'm very excited about the potential of this kind of stuff. And I love the usability that like, I just run you know, NPX Rweave upload, uh, give it a file. In this case, I gave it a whole you know, HTML file, this one here for uh, each of the chapters of finding the blue book, pay pay a fee uh, once off, and it's there, it's done uh, forever. So that's that's kind of interesting. And I'm not hosting this myself. Uh, none of those concerns uh, arise, and, and that all comes down to AIIA. They have two things. The, the dominant on the network at the moment is called wildfire, which makes sense if you're going to call something wildfire. It is probably going to spread. I have another one called Weaver, which is also kind of interesting. Hopefully more and more people will write agents, will write strategies for our weave nodes that do different things. And then, uh, you know, you're kind of incentivized as a node operator to incentivize other nodes that you see doing 
pro-social things, which means you're incentivized to incentivize other nodes that do things similar to what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, if, if there is a, a majority of honest nodes, that means that there is this really kind of thickened ecology. There's this wonderful uh, potential for increasingly pro-social infinite games where we're all kind of writing our weave agents to act in the most pro-social ways and therefore receive these little incentives from other people who are running some of the strategies to ourselves and therefore want to incentivize that because they're all these interesting incentive feedback loops. So that's our weave. Um, I used, as I say, this particular tool to, uh, to get uh, the files that I have given you in your assets folder onto it. Uh, you can experiment with your own stuff uh, and you know, create your own contract metadata, create your own books or whatever NFTs you like. And then the only thing kind of left to do, right, uh, is to actually deploy the stuff onto Rinkaby, which is really cool. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just make sure that this uh that my contract is fully up to date and that i'm not going to deploy it with a your url here this is the metadata that i need uh so if i just go in, in here and make sure this is definitely the one that i want uh, which it is then i should be able to uh, deploy the stuff on rinkaby uh, this is really the moments of truth. Uh, one aspect that I did not really test before uh, this particular session. Uh, let's see what happens when I deploy Babel onto Rinkaby. Uh, we've got network Rinkaby, wonderful. We're using the proxy address for Rinkaby. My deployer address is as I expect it to be. Um, it might take a little, a little time to get itself up and running. Um, I wonder if there's any, oh, there we go, okay. Um, Babel is now deployed on Rinkaby. I'm just going to uh, take that address that you saw pop up in my terminal and put it into uh, my environment variables, which is why I've stopped my screen share for one second. That's probably not the kind of thing that you want to share. Uh, so there we go. I've got that uh, all set up. It's now deployed on Rinkaby. We've got our, our first real live, you know, we've done like a few deploys on Rinkaby for Ethernauts, uh, which, which is one thing, but we've got our first real live contract that we've written ourselves and gone through step-by-step step onto a real Ethereum test network, which is a huge moment. Uh, it's really incredible to have come all of this way. I told you that it was going to take us about six hours <laughs> to get there, and it has. <laughs> uh, but there we go, our first contract on Rinkaby. And now, of course, we want to actually kind of mint some stuff, right? Uh, and this metadata URI we've looked at already, uh, and we're going to run the same mint token task that we've already tested locally, but we're just going to make sure that it happens on the Rinkaby network. Um, this also could, could take a moment. But you know, in these last few minutes, I really want to kind of emphasize again that the reason that I've gone to such uh, lengths to describe as much of the code as I can and to walk you through some of my own thinking, flawed though it definitely is, uh, is because like this, uh, this repo can serve as a springboard to your own uh, development and exploration, right? Um, I think that it contains as far as like, I've seen some of the most up-to-date tooling and uh, most secure patterns and ways of doing things that, that I am aware of at the moment. Uh, there are many other ways that we can look at and, and will in the weeks to come. But uh, in terms of like the, like the compromises that I have made myself in, in my own kind of work, this is where I've landed and Again, like there are many other ways of doing things and I will look a little bit at Sora very, very quickly. Uh, if you give me five extra minutes at the end of this, but 
uh, when I was sort of putting together these contracts and thinking about the guardians and what it would look like to have a book controlled uh, in each chapter by a different NFT, this was kind of the best thing that I had found. And, and once again, it's, it's really all Holly Grimm's work. She is the best and uh, it's sort of shamelessly copied from, from her because she's the best. <laughs> um, so you can see that we have a successful, uh, let's just take a look at this, a successful mint transaction on Rinkaby. So not only do we have our first contracts that we've written ourselves on Rinkaby, we've just deployed our first, we've just created our first NFT. Um, which is massively exciting. And if you are kind of following along, you can grab your Mint2 address uh, from this. And if you go to testnets.opensea.io, you should be able to search by your address. Uh, and you should see here, uh, Your taking a little while to fetch the photos, which is a pity. But here, here it is, right? Uh, Babel NFT uh, that you can see on on Rinkaby. Uh, it's taking because it's the test nets version. There, not as uh, with it in terms of loading images and this kind of stuff. But uh, this is. This, it's done, right? It's like your NFT is now on uh, on OpenSea. You can uh, show that you can sort of refresh the metadata. You should be able to uh, put it up for sale and these kinds of things, which, uh, which I will, uh, you can make an offer on it if you're, maybe that's why. Just check that if I sign in, I might be able to show you what I really mean here. Oh, I cannot quite, uh, there we go. I can transfer it easily, which is just one, uh, one click away. I can sell it easily, which is also just one click away. It doesn't require approving and then allowing uh, another transaction when somebody actually buys it because of all of the native meta transaction stuff that I've done. And if uh, OpenSea kind of gets its act together on its test net domain, perhaps we'll see the image pop up here in a moment or or not. Um, we should be able to see the details associated with this, which is where our contract is. Uh, and yeah, it takes a little while on deployments for this like about Babel V3 will be where uh, the description that I wrote here, I like the dot not the parts. Uh, would appear. You can put your own description uh, to appear there. And the, this, I mean, description will appear in about Babel v3. And this description here should include all of the different attributes uh, and stuff that you see associated with this particular NFT. So it's the NFT description and attributes which will appear in this top box on OpenSea and then the contract description, which will appear in your know, about Babel v3. And because we've set up everything, as I say, like you should be able to transfer or sell exactly as you please. Uh, that, is, that is the OpenSea stuff. Um, the, are there any questions or comments before I go off on, on another tangent for those who are able to stick around? Covered a lot of ground today, you know, OpenSea proxies, Wyvern protocols, first order exchanges, are we deploying onto Rinkaby, ERC721 tradable stuff. Uh, it's, it's been a real adventure. So. Uh, uh, maybe hopefully, if you, it a lot, but it's, yeah. two minutes uh, we can spare.
I have a question which is generally about you know um, transfers and, and transferable uh, NFTs. You mentioned about you showed the tradable contract, right? Where you whitelist specific addresses. So I was thinking if you create an NFT which is kind of personal, like uh, whatever, right? Like pop or something. And what would you consider kind of preventing selling, like whitelisting or just you know not listing any addresses that can this can be self sold to? versus just you know a very verifying that the owner of the nft is the one who is supposed to own it in the beginning kind of two approaches yeah um you know one way of preventing sales is just to remove the transfer functionality mm -hmm. uh and uh that's probably like the most foolproof way of doing it um, so that like the person that it is minted to uh, is the person that has it and, and there's no, no means of transferring it. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other, I, I, I wasn't ex exactly sure I followed it, exactly what you were saying the other option was, I'm sorry. Um, I would, I'm saying that uh, instead of preventing someone to sell, the NFT, maybe there's reason for him to sell him, her, it doesn't matter. But I do want to make sure that the NFT owner is the one who was the, who the NFT was minted to, so that he'll be able to do some action which is otherwise not permitted. Right? If you if you handle me an NFT, which is a key to some action, I want to make sure that you are the, the real owner of the NFT and you didn't sell it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, making them non-transferable is kind of the only foolproof way of doing that. Otherwise, you have to like go in and change. Uh, I have to like, verify that the NFT was minted with the address that the user is actually trying to get some action to do, right? I guess because you're gonna have to maintain some kind of like mapping in your contract of like. Uh, accounts like addresses to token ids um which could get expensive depending on how many nfts you're talking about or as i say like just disable transfers um, gotcha. okay thanks I th yeah. yeah so OpenSea is still taking its sweet time um to load any kind of images um, about this, which is uh, kind of a pity. Um, but you can see that I was uh, testing this and it does definitely work uh, if you give OpenSea just a moment. Uh, and here is sort of where you'll see uh, the description, which is that field from over here. Uh, the properties, which pops up if you give it attributes, uh, which is wonderful. Um, and then uh, about your contract, which comes from our contract metadata and any details like where it's deployed network. So that's kind of what you're expecting to see and, and everything works as one hopes. The last thing that I kind of wanted just to show you was this array, uh, which is a Zora uh, based uh, piece of work from a wonderful, wonderful developer called TBTS. TL. Uh, and this is um, what allows for it's linked in the NFTs channel. Files as NFTs, uh, which is just enormously cool. And so you can go and play, play with it on, on Zora. And I thought that I would just kind of very, very briefly show you kind of uh, potentially why I think Zora might be like long-term more interesting than OpenSea uh, because it's just so much simpler. See, none of the, none of the stuff around, uh, you know, context mixing in meta transactions, these kinds of things, which also means that perhaps the UX isn't quite as good, but I think they have some of their own solutions to that. Uh, and this, this array contract is just innumerable. Uh, there's nothing special going on about it. Uh, it also put, 
there's one like special thing that they're doing here, which is uh, the ELC-165 declaration for royalties, which is kind of fun to know about. Um, and then everything else that you see here should be kind of uh, par for the course, considering what we've looked at in this guild so far. Is a supports interface line again for 165 specifying this royalties ERC, which is another interesting one that you can go and look at if you're into NFTs and this kind of stuff. It's 2981. Uh, one extra um, function for real royalty info, which hard codes 10% of royalty fees for creators, because you have to kind of do these things uh, in your contract for Zora. Again, trade-offs. You, know, you don't have, you don't necessarily have to do that for OpenSea, but then there's a little bit of trust that goes along with OpenSea, and some problems have arisen around that as well. So, like, either you hard code it in your contracts, or you trust someone. You've got to decide based on your context and intentions which one is better, and then the rest fairly straightforward. Uh, and it's this, uh, it's this. Um, contract which allows for the dynamic sort of p5.js and a lot like here you can see that this is the kind of mapping that i was talking about you know that they are keeping track of their token creators so like you could potentially find creative ways of using that kind of thing uh -huh. minted nfts of a particular kind and therefore give them particular uh roles or permissions in your work if that kind of thing appealed but yeah, just another another way of doing things, and um, one that I really like because if you go and play around, uh, like just follow the tweet in the Guild NFT channel, and the first the first thing that you can see is like a really nice little canvas that draws circles as you move your mouse around, and it's, and it's an NFT, which is amazing. And there's in fact a whole playground that you can mess around with if you if you know a bit about P5. JS, which is a cool library. And I found it enormously. It was like very uh, zen, you know, it was like, you know, those like little zen gardens that you like rake, make, make nice little patterns. I had that kind of sense of like making circles. <laughs> like, oh, this is, this is sweet. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Um, so many different approaches, many different ways. Uh, I hope that's the main thing that, yeah, I wanted to sort of get across is just how cool our weave is. Um, that, that was really my intention, most of this. Um, but this repo should, as I say, give you the kind of real foundation that you need for your own work. Uh, don't do what I did, <laughs> but you know, use what appeals to you and, and what, you, what you like and, and run with it. Uh, I think that the TypeScript stuff is really attractive. I think that the way that Holly has laid it out and logical separation of different uh, things is really attractive. Uh, the disarray repo that I've just shown you now also has some front end stuff also in TypeScript. So you can you can sort of put the two together because what I haven't given you uh, in NFTZ is any any kind of front end stuff because we've, we've just been working directly from the terminal to deploy contracts and mint tokens uh, and this kind of stuff. Um, but if you do want to have some tight integration and you're looking for a good place to start with a front end that also speaks TypeScript so that you can have just strongly typed stuff all the way through, this disarray repo is, is a really, really good place to start. Only 13 minutes over. It's better than the first time. So. <laughs> <laughs> any any last comments questions um, songs jokes dances drum beats uh, yeah i have a question i thought we did send the config file the other stuff config file the style in errors i've sent the screenshots i don't know if you've seen this Gloria, I'm struggling to hear you. Could you repeat that? Okay, I said after updating the config file, I started uh, having some errors. I sent the screenshot. I don't know if you have seen it. Okay, uh, I'm 
go I'm going to be really brave and open Slack. If I disappear, it's not because I don't like you, it's because my computer died. Uh, it's, no, I think I think it's in this chat on Is it in chat? It's not on Slack. Oh, too late. <laughs> okay, sorry, it's all good. We're we're okay. We're okay. Uh, I have to download these. Uh, Andy, thanks so much. I'm moving to the next session. I'll see you there. Thanks, man. Please, yeah, yeah. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, let's see. Okay, while you are searching for it, some few more questions from the or the EMV file. Okay, so not Laurie, quite... Okay, can yeah, you hear me? That's yes. This this area is, is happening because you uh, you don't have the mint token task. So you, you you may not have checked out lesson two at the beginning. Uh, if you get get check out lesson two, will get you that that mint token task. Uh, it's it's erroring out because you don't have it. Um, it says cannot find module tasks operations mint token. So uh, if you let me show you your tasks uh, folder should look like this deployment and operations. And this is where okay. like the mint token operation the token task is um, so you'll need to uh, so what did i really need i think i've been following all along not yeah this was at this was at the beginning um so but um but um but um but um what we can do is if you uh if you try Um, just try that just check out the next lesson um uh, but it's probably going to give you some issues if you do that oh does that checkout work i don't think that it will i've already checked out uh, lesson two before i started you did yeah when did you do that because i updated it this morning okay, so we started this session uh, and you don't have, do you have the operations folder in your tasks directory? No, I don't have it. Cool. We, I, I will help you uh, in the uh, Slack channel uh, and we'll, we'll get this sorted. I would... Okay, so um, one more thing. For the dot em refi i'm not quite sure what to put in for the infora api key the yeah, that's kind of API key and all that cool i can help you with that as well i'll show you where to, where to get one and uh, and what to put in there um, all right thank you it's a pleasure it's a pleasure i'll be in that stack channel now and uh, we can we can just work through these last few things thank you again it's been lovely uh goodbye to the zoom recording